Awesome, there we go. The session is being recorded. Um, so, hey everyone, my name is Mark Takata. I am the technical evangelist for Adobe Cold Fusion, and welcome to my webinar. Today we're gonna be speaking about NFTs, Cold Fusion, and you. Um, before I start, uh, just a little bit of a change to the normal layouts that you might have been uh, familiar with in the past. Uh, we've changed it up a little bit with the way that this is uh, all laid out. We now have a Q&A uh, pod for you to ask your questions so that um, Aishwara or myself can go in and, and answer directly questions instead of having to go back kind of through the chat because um, that can get a little bit messy. Uh, feel free, of course, for everyone to to chat and you know talk amongst yourselves in the uh, in the public chat. Um, if you have direct questions about NFTs or anything else for me, uh, for that matter, uh, please go ahead and put it into the Q and I uh, Q and I Q and A <laughs> Q and I is a book Q and A pod, uh, and we will go back uh, potentially at the end, uh, possibly you know during uh, as I, as I'm talking as well if it happens to be something I can answer right away. So. With that, uh, with that done, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I am a developer, I'm a programmer. Uh, I know a dozen or more languages that I've used professionally over a career spanning uh, more than two decades. And Adobe hired me last year about, oh gosh, almost a year ago to be the evangelist for Cold Fusion. And the things I do are things like this. I do webinars, I speak at conferences, I'm I'm in the Slack channel. I'm in the Facebook channel. I'm I write blogs. I travel around. I speak to customers, and I help communicate customer needs and wants and pain points and and requests uh, and all of that to our engineering team to try and connect people uh, to the support team. I'm kind of a hub, so my door is always open. Uh, at the end, you'll see an email. You can always email me. Feel free if you guys are having issues. If you, if you're having problems. You can always email me uh, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. So without further ado, <clears throat> let's go to NFTs. But before we can talk about NFTs, we have to talk about blockchain. And that's really going to be, um, uh, this is going to be the part that I, I think <laughs> no one is going to be satisfied with my explanation of what blockchain is. A lot of people have questions about it. Uh, you know, everyone knows from maybe a little bit to I've made my own coin, right? Like there's this really, really huge gradient on knowledge of what blockchain is. But I think for, for the most part, the vast majority of people are maybe hearing about NFTs for the first time now. They're kind of, they've, they've, they, they're having a moment. Um, but to understand what an NFT is, it's really critical and important to understand what blockchain is. So what is blockchain? It's a ledger. Um, and a ledger is a, a one by one, basically linear record of some sort, right? And so you can think of this if you have a ledger at a store, that ledger is showing you the things that were purchased, for example, or things that were bought. Right. Um, that's one example. Right. So basically a blockchain is like that, except that each position in that ledger is fully transparent. It shows you what's inside of it. And the next position is gained or earned through uh, something called proof of work. And proof of work is essentially taking the previous data that has already been in the blockchain and running it against a very, very complex, difficult to solve algorithm. There's no cheating here. There's no way to get in to the next position. You can't guess what that position is. You can't fake it um, because each position will show you what was in the previous ones and so on and so forth. So any position in there that's inserted or injected or in some way modified will very, very quickly be seen as a fraud because it'll just break the chain, it'll break the blockchain. Um, and one of the ideas behind blockchain is that you can have ownership of a particular block, a particular position. Oh, wait a minute. People are saying no audio or video. Uh, it's weird. Oh, interesting. 
Um, so folks that are having some issues, um, Aishwara, could you, uh, could you maybe ask people in the chat um, if, you're ha if they're having issues to try and maybe restart? It sounds like some people are having problems and others are not. Um, so hopefully that gets resolved for the folks that are having an issue. Um, you may have to switch browsers. I'm, I'm terribly sorry about that. Um, we did just change the technology that's running this. And so uh, potentially if you have an older browser, it may not work. Uh, sorry about that. Um, Moving, moving along though, um, so you've all heard about block. Uh, you've you've all heard about Bitcoin, I'm sure, right? <laughs> unless you've been, unless you've been under a rock, a very large rock, you, you've you've heard about Bitcoin. And so, what Bitcoin essentially is, it's taking each of those positions in the blockchain and assigning those ownership potentially to someone. Um, that that you know buys it or in some other way gets ownership, right? You can grant it to people if you had ownership before. Um, you can mine it, uh, which you've I'm sure heard about these Bitcoin miners that have these giant arrays of computers solving those incredibly complex mathematical equations that earn you the and and this should be clear by the way it earns you the potential to get the next spot in the blockchain. So if a, if a multitude of people are trying to, to get it, just because you're trying to get it does not necessarily mean that you will get that spot in the blockchain. Um, so it, it can be kind of a little bit, um, a little bit nuts. So <clears throat> let's talk about what an NFT actually is. So the, the letters NFT, which I'm considering just calling nifty because it would drive people absolutely crazy if I did that, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off. Um, NFT stands for non-fungible token, of which you're probably like, <laughs> what? Fungus? Fungus token? Like, what is that? What is that? So um, let's talk about what a fungible token is. A fungible token is is a token or maybe like, let's, let's give an example. So um, a dollar coin, right? Um, if I had a dollar coin and I gave you a dollar coin and you gave me that, you know, your dollar coin back, those things are, are equal. They're, they're fungible. They're replaceable. There's no one that is different than the other. They have the same value. Um, they're transferable, et cetera, et cetera. You can just pull them across. And so you can think of a coin in this case as a token, but it can be anything, right? It can be a dollar bill. Um, and, you know, these days who actually uses cash, right? So uh, it can be any uh, type of currency across the planet that you can transfer and pretty much one, you know, one dollar, one euro um, is the same as, as as another, right? So that's that's a fungible token. And Bitcoin is like this, right? One Bitcoin is the same as another Bitcoin. It doesn't really matter which position in the blockchain you own. It's still worth... Well, it's worth less today than it was last week. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, crypto folks. Um, but that's kind of the way the things roll. Um, so, okay, well, what about like, what if it's a non-fungible? Like, what what does that mean? Well, let's take that, that coin again. Let's say that it actually was misminted at the U.S. Mint. Something happened to it where it double printed, which happens sometimes, or something got in there, you know, maybe, I don't know, like a, a piece of something got in there and it was misminted, but it got into circulation. Usually those are thrown away and they're, they're inspected and they don't get into circulation, but sometimes they get in. And so you have one of those. Technically it's worth a dollar, right? Because that is what we have all determined a dollar coin is worth, it's worth a dollar and you can transfer it for, I don't know, a stick of gum these days. But you have a very special one and you probably wouldn't want to transfer that. Coin collectors might want that particular coin. It has value because it's derived from market forces. There's coin collectors for whom that particular coin has value. How much value? Well, it depends how much they're willing to spend. Right. And so in this case, now we have a non fungible token. We have a token which is unique and is provably unique. Right. Like you couldn't you couldn't fake that. You couldn't like, 
and make a cast of it and fill it with whatever and do silver paint like you, you that would immediately be seen as, as a fraud right um so that's kind of what nfts are in a digital sense except that not only can they be you know some kind of coin which usually they're not really coins because they'd have to be unique in some way but they're images they're music they're 3d objects uh, occasionally they're concepts with <laughs> somebody somebody minted an nft which was like in their imagination and sold it for a quarter million dollars we live in the weirdest timeline um but uh, this is kind of where nfts are and people are using them for art um some people are using them to um to certify things and and put them on the blockchain now why would you do that right that's always the question like like nfts oh i can just right click copy and i get the thing that that you 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 know you you say has value. I got it for free, right? Like, why is it an NFT? Well, it's not just the the image, right? In some ways, it's the stake of ownership that is also valuable. Like, if you purchase a painting, a physical painting, right, and then someone steals it from you, right, uh, and it's a little different because in in this case, like you know, it still exists in in, in your collection if it's an NFT. Um, the value of that painting will actually change because now it's a stolen painting, right? And so the value of that, depending on how famous it is, it might be impossible to sell. So before it was worth half a million dollars, but you know, it was the, the Mona Mark, right? So it's a picture of me going like this or something. Well, everyone knows that it's stolen. Nobody wants to buy it because you know, if they see it in your collection, unless they really want to have it, the value will go down, right? And so here we see, even in physical things which change ownership from people, the value changes depending on, on how you've acquired it. If you've acquired it legally, if you used an NFT minting technique and it's on the blockchain, it's provable, you can see the ID, all of that, then it has a value. Um, you know, what's that value? I don't know. It depends who is buying it. Um, there are NFT pieces, there are pieces of NFT art out there that are fetching, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars per per image. Um, and some of them also, by the way, it's, you know, they sort of cheat. Like if you own a particular, I think Bored Apes is like this. If you own one of those using NFTs, like you have an ownership stake in them on the blockchain, you're part of an elite group that can go to, I don't know, clubs. Like it's a, it's a way into a club or something like that, right? So they kind of added additional things to it, but you can kind of see it's a, it's a provable, very, very difficult, if not impossible to fake method of showing that you have an ownership of a particular non fungible token on the blockchain, right? You can, you can show them, here's my ID. Here's my, here's my ape, right? Like I own this. You can see that it's in the, it's in the ledger. It shows that it was transferred to me and now I own it anyway. Okay. So <laughs> enough about NFTs. Um, because I could go on and on. Um, what are like, so how do you get, like, how do you get an NFT? Like, where do you go? Like, do you go to the NFT market? Yes, you do. You go to an NFT marketplace and there's a number of them out there. Um, the biggest one, which is the one that I'm going to be doing a little bit of code. I'm going to do some code sharing and show you how to go in and uh, leverage their, their API is OpenSea. So OpenSea is sort of the, you know, 100 pound board ape in the uh, in the NFT marketplace arena. Uh, but there's a ton of other ones. I mean, NBA Top Shot is also absolutely ginormous, right? They sell moments, they sell NBA moments with different players. Uh, and it's huge. There's a lot of trading that goes on. I actually have a lot of friends. There's a local team here um, that is very, very involved in NFTs. They have their own minted NFT of their uh, of their <clears throat> mascot. Um, and a lot of folks here were doing trading with NBA Top Shot. I know a guy who spent like 60 bucks and he ended up, you know, he, I think he made like 200, 300 bucks off of it after a couple of months of trading. So not a millionaire. Um, and there's a little bit of luck, like it was really difficult to get in. Anyway, that's kind of a story that you'll hear a lot with, with NFTs. And by the way, to be totally clear, this is not a way to get rich. Like, don't don't believe the hype. Um, 
you know, can you? Yeah, I mean, people do. People have. People have paid off their houses. Um, and if you're a brilliant artist and you have a great idea, um, yeah, I mean, you know, go for it. Do it. It's fairly easy and cheap to get into. These marketplaces just require you to 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 buy like a small stake in whatever blockchain they're minting on, um, so that you could do what's called a gas fee. And a gas fee pays for your initial like entry into the system. It just pays for some of their electricity basically uh, and their work to, to get it set up. So to give you an idea, um, I actually, I minted a few things just, you know, for a demo. Yay, fun. Um, and I, you know, I think I put in like a hundred bucks worth a while back and I still have, I don't know, like 70 of it after spent, after like messing up on a different NFT setup and having to un- mint something which is very expensive by the way they don't like you removing stuff from the blockchain it's very expensive it's very um it's very co computationally intensive and so i think it was like 25 dollars to unmint uh whereas it's free to mint and then if a sale happens they take a cut off the top that's how these it's how open c works anyway um and they are on ethereum which is going to become important later when we're looking at the code there's a bunch of different um blockchains out there that you can mint onto they also support something called polygon it's a little cheaper it's less well known and you always have to be careful because these things could potentially disappear i mean i don't think ethereum will disappear um probably polygon won't disappear either it's been around you know there's quite a number of people using it um but just kind of keep that in mind. If you find a marketplace, you're like, oh, this is sweet. These guys are totally free. There's no gas fees or whatever. They're using this other weird blockchain that they made themselves or something. Um, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Like, that might not be good long term. But anyway, you know, so uh, buyer beware when you're going into these. Um, so let's talk about... So we talked a little bit about what you get in. Oh, and and also, so minting is available at most of these these marketplaces, but also they offer things like display. Um, they offer things like um, sales and tracking of the things that you've sold. So you know you can you can do things like let's say you make drawings and you want to sell them for ten bucks a pop or something, and you just like you know draw once a day, and you have hundreds of things that you want to put on there. It'll actually track. Things like how often it sold, how much they sold for, average sale. Um, it'll show you who the owners are because one of the neat things here, by the way, is, um, and this is an optional thing, but most NFT artists do this, is you can uh, request that a portion of any future sales of your NFT go back to you. And so, like, I think I asked for, you know, 1.5% of any future sales to come back to me. So I, if I sell something for 100 bucks and then they turn around and suddenly, oh, Mark's famous NFTs, it sells for a thousand. Well, then I'm going to get 1% of that um, future sale. And, you know, who knows, maybe they'll <laughs> sell it for a hundred thousand or a million. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, and I would prefer if they bought mine originally for a million, but um, that's not going to happen because that's not reality. Um, so what about OpenSea itself? Um, so OpenSea does have an API and it is, uh, the documentation is public. You can go over there and check it out uh, at docs.opensea.io reference API overview. Um, one thing to keep in mind, and this has been the case for most of the marketplaces that I've seen, this could potentially change, but it's only for display. It's only for pulling down things like assets, uh, data names, costs, sales records, things like that. There's no, there's no minting. Certainly, um, they don't have a an API for you to send in an asset to have them mint it and and do all of the things. Um, that happens actually on OpenSea's website. So that's very important to, to to think about when you're thinking about how to leverage this. Um, there's no selling through your own website. You do have to go over to to OpenSea. They have uh, integrations with a number of different crypto wallets. Uh, and so that's, again, important. And that's really not something you'd want to set up yourself. That's complicated and 
I don't know. I, I would I would be very nervous kind of working in this in, in, in that world. They've figured it out and they've made it really easy. Like you can just go there and you know, if you I, I use MetaMask for my wallet, but if you just put in your wallet info, boom, you just go in and it works and goes. Um, and you cannot buy directly uh, through your own interface. Um, so those are pretty important things. Um, and uh, by the way, also for OpenSea in particular, and uh, this is something I believe that changed recently. They've gotten way more popular. I think they're just kind of getting a little bit hammered um, on stuff. But basically, uh, they have a rate limited API right now for some of the things. Um, for some, it's just open, uh, like to pull down, I believe, like collection, like top level collection info, you can just do it all day long, and they don't really care. Uh, pulling down assets, though, so pictures of the actual NFTs, uh, all of that, like the actual deep, the deep dive, like drill down, double click data, actually is behind a rate wall, unless you get an API key from them, which you have to go in and request. And they ask to, you know, like, where is it going to be? They ask you why you're asking for an API key. And they actually, um, they kind of manually, <laughs> they manually grant these. And so I asked for an API key. So this, this actually changed. I had, I had a whole set of uh, code for all this. And then a few days ago, I went in to just kind of clean up and dust off a couple things and everything broke because they had added in this thing. They actually put themselves behind Cloudflare, um, just I think because they're very popular and they're getting hit really, really hard and probably to prevent themselves from getting uh, denial of service attacked by folks because some people are like that. Um, and so I requested at that time several days ago, I think it was Tuesday maybe, uh, I, I requested an API key and I still have not received it. So... Um, you know, this is something to kind of plan. You can definitely build out your uh, your prototype, your proof of concept, your MVP without the API key, but to, to send it to production where it's actually going to like get hit. I think the rate limit is something like 20 per second, which is not bad. Um, 20 calls per, per, per second through it, which I mean, you know, that's fine for testing. You could even have a team testing if you have five people going in and, and kind of going. But the moment you put that out, um, and if you have any kind of audience at all, it, they're going to like hit that that rate limit. So definitely think ahead and get that API key request in. Uh, you'll probably want something and somewhere to show them like this is the place that it's going to be. So if you have a website that you're going to be integrating this with, uh, send them that, which is a great foray into why in the world would you want to do what I'm going to show you here? Like, what, like there's a website. Uh, OpenSea has a website that you can go to that shows all of your NFTs. Why would you ever want to not like utilize that? Well, there's a few reasons. So one could just be that you don't like the way that their website display looks. That's, you know, that's a totally fair thing. And in fact, I'm going to, um, let me just pull, let me just pull that up. So this throw some code up here too. Um, so this right here, this is the OpenSea website up uh, in the upper, in the right side of your screen. And here you're actually seeing, this is my, uh, <laughs> this is my ridiculous, my admittedly ridiculous NFT art portfolio, right? So uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, this is not a great uh, looking website. It's white on white. There's very, very little of, you know, you, you have the OpenSea logo at the top. Um, you, you know, you can search for other collections here, whereas, you know, you kind of want people to look at the stuff that you have and, and do the stuff that you actually want. So, yeah, so maybe you want to build your own site to display this and, and, and only display this, right? You might just have, you know, you want Mark's Magic NFT site to have it. But more likely is, since you're probably an artist or you're working with an artist who wants to do this, you know, you're the developer on a project, they probably have a website already on which their art lives, right? They might have a place that has pictures of their sculptures or uh, pictures of their paintings or digital art, right? They probably already have something like that. And it would be awkward and weird if they had to take and link out from that website 
and then go to OpenSea. It's a very, it would be a jarring, very poor experience for the user to do that, right? And so what you probably would want to do is you'd want to integrate with their website and use the API so that you're pulling real data, real time, live uh, into their into their site, and it all kind of looks the same and looks good. So um, just real quick, let's look at that. So this is my amazing website. As you can see, minimalism is my, sorry, apologies. I, I, I got everything else done except for the homepage and, and went, wow, this looks awful. Um, so yay, so this is, this is my paintings, right? This is my amazing painting site. Let's pretend that it's better than Open Seas. I'm not an artist, by the way. Uh, at least not a not a designer for, uh, for for websites. Clearly, as you can tell by this, right? And so I've got my my paintings here, right? And it's got stuff here, and you know you can you can go and and buy a print or something on on Smug Mug. I put in here, but you know it'd probably be something different where you know email Mark to buy the original or something, right? And so cool. But then I also want to have NFTs on the same site that look the same. And as you can see, I'm pulling in the data from here, the images, the information, the names, the prices, things like that. And I'm displaying them in the same UI, right? So this is a much more likely use case for what I'm gonna show you here with the code. So um, about half an hour in, so I should probably get to the code. Um, the code is fairly straightforward though, so uh, hopefully it won't take too long. So let's take a look at what we're doing here. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so let's start out at the top. So, uh, and also uh, the, the way that I do this is maybe a little bit, uh, <laughs> a, a little bit weird. Um, but I'll explain why I did it this way in a second. So at the very top, what you see there is I'm making a CF HTTP call here, very standard, very normal uh, call. The method is get um, because of course, it's there's no writes, there's no deletes, there's nothing. This is a pure display, it's a pull. So you're gonna do a get. Um, this line here though, this is something very important uh, to, to kind of keep an eye on the user agent. So um, and you're probably familiar with this in some cases, some endpoints do not want you to hit it with an automated process for a multitude of reasons. Maybe they only want it internally available. Maybe they only want people in browsers to be able to view the information. For whatever reason it is, sometimes it's blocked. This is actually what changed, part of the things that changed on their API. Originally, I was able to do this just by hitting it with CFHTTP with no user agent. Um, and then suddenly uh, they put it behind Cloudflare and Cloudflare said, mm -mm -mm, not allowed. Uh, so I just had to put this in. Not a really big uh, big deal necessarily, but I was like, ah, glad I checked before I did this demo and everything broke. Um, I put it into a result here and this is the URL. So, um, and let me unpack this a little bit. So I'm hitting API open um, the API version is one. There is only a version one right now. Um, they are working on other versions. And also um, this version, according to their API, I have not tested this, this version only pulls back Ethereum minted NFTs. So if you're pulling back a mix or you're pulling back something from Polygon, um, that might have, there might be some issues. They're still working on the Polygon API or one that supports Polygon API. So, um, you know, and any other minting process that they end up putting in place there, I don't think this will this will support it out of the box right now. There's gonna be more versions, um, so that would change. And then after the V1, it's the type of call that you can make. And so the type of call can be anything from assets to collection. Um, there's a lot of different options out there for, for you to hit. And all of that is actually available let me do, 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 do. API, actually, uh, open C API. Um, you can actually see all of the information. I, I had this link earlier in my talk, uh, but you can kind of see it here. Um, you can see there's, there's assets, there's events, there's the account, 
uh, collections and it kind of shows you all of the things that you can do here. Um, as you can see, Polygon uh, APIs, V2 API will be coming. Um, so again, I think a lot of people just kind of use Ethereum, but Polygon is cheaper. So it's gonna be important to kind of keep that in mind in the future if you're building something with this. Oopsie daisy. Okay, there we go. So um, cool. So uh, I also, you have to send a header, an accept header uh, over to it. That's kind of normal and, and expected. Cool. So then I do another CFHTTP call. Uh, and this is kind of funny. As, as I was reviewing my code, I realized I actually get this data. So I didn't really need it. Um, whoops. Uh, but what I'm doing here is I'm pulling just the data for the collection itself, not for the assets that are living inside of the collection. Um, and what I had not realized at the time was that you actually do get a node in that original assets thing that, that has this data in it. I just didn't think about it. Um, there's a lot that comes back and I'm gonna show you what the raw result is and all of the data in there and it's, it's, it's quite a lot. So um, then what I do is I deserialize because of course it's returning in, in JSON format. I deserialize it uh, into arrays and structs and all that good stuff. And as you can see here, I'm actually kind of digging down deep. I'm clicking, you know, double clicking into the data because the actual raw result of this is even, I mean, I'll show you in a second, but it gets like, weird. <laughs> it gets weird. It's just so much stuff is being returned by this that I wanted to kind of get around that. Um, I kind of wish that they would create a GraphQL endpoint. That would be nice. I could just pull back the things I wanted, but they don't have that yet. So we shall see. Um, so we move down and this is all normal stuff. Um, and yes, I know I probably should have put this into a CFC and was calling the CFC, but I find it's just easier for folks to understand if I have everything in the page, please don't do this in production, right? Uh, separation of concerns, put things into CFCs so that they can have reuse, all of that good stuff, uh, please. So as we get down in here, you can kind of see, so we've got the collection name, um, we've got the average price. These are all things that are being returned by the, um, uh, by, the um, uh, by the API. And then we get into where we loop through stuff. Now, you're probably noticing, hey, wait a minute. You started in CF script, but then you pop into tags. Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm a guy who feels tags are still valuable in some cases for some things. Um, to do the type of thing that I'm doing here with pure CF script, totally doable and lots of people do it. Um, you know, and especially if you have like a front end framework that you could like tie it into and it'll generate all the data. Um, I didn't want to do that. I just kind of wanted to keep it simple. And so, uh, using tags in this case makes it super easy for you to see what's happening. So we loop through the collection, um, and we just put in things like the preview URL, the name, um, when it was created, right? The current price. And this is the fun part. Uh, this is something to kind of uh, keep an eye on, um, Oh, I'm actually returning this. So let me let me show you this. This is uh, this is fun. Uh, cool. So this is uh, this is the return. By the way, this this array uh, here is actually the return that's pulling each of these cards data into place, right? So <clears throat> as you come down through here and you see things like you know the information about each individual piece, let's come down, let's see. I think I need to find one that actually has, ah, okay. So something to keep in mind, if something is for sale, uh, that's the only time that a price will be determined and, and shown, right? So um, let me pop this, well, it's already up, it's at the top here. So um, I do check for sell order being null. If it's, if it's null, then it's not for sale. If it's not null, then there's actually something and it shows you a price. And I would love for someone who knows Ethereum to explain to me why the price that's being returned is seven, five and goodness gracious, look at all those zeros. Um, because the actual price that is being set, if I go in here and look at this, it's 0.075 Ethereum. That's the price that's, you know, so it's 0.075 of whatever Ethereum happens to be at the moment. 
Um, I don't know, that's like a couple hundred bucks or something, right? So why is it coming back as that? I have no idea. Um, but what it means is that when you're returning that and showing the actual price, I'm having to do a little bit of ETL, <laughs> awful ETL, to get the price to show correctly. I don't know why that is. Uh, so maybe someone knows they they could tell me. Um, and so yeah, so you can kind of go down in here and you can see uh, I'm changing whether it's you know view or buy on OpenSea. And there's a link here um, that I'm sending out to the permalink, which again is something that's coming back inside of each of these individual uh, array results from OpenSea's API. Um, now, if I scroll down far enough here, and my thing doesn't crash, here's the second struct. So this is actually, this is the struct that I'm pulling back just the collection data from. Um, and you can see it's got a description, um, you know, there's there's some URLs. Um, as you'll notice, by the way, this, is, this could be important for you depending on what, um, you know, like where you're hosting and all that. Uh, OpenSea does host its images in Google. So if you're on another cloud um, and there's any kind of problem, you know, pulling stuff across from Google, I don't think there would be, um, but just keep in mind, that's where they hold it. And you really don't have a choice in that matter. That is that is their thing and they, they hold it there. Um, so the funny part here, of course, is that this data actually came back and I'd have to find it here, but it does come back somewhere in the main assets uh, collection. So one last thing um, that I did wanna kind of show, cause this is a mistake I made very early on and it's a very easy mistake to make. Um, and what that is, is if you go into their API overview and you look at retrieving assets, and let me make this a little wider so you can see. So they actually have a really nice API. You can put in your owner string, your token IDs, you know, all of this information. It will actually generate um, a, uh, you know, what your code should look like, like what your URL should look like. It's a little bit broken right now because this API key is not optional inside of their UI. Very important to know. Um, it is absolutely optional for you just to be using it in your own code, rate limited, of course. But if you try to use this here without an API key and use their actual uh, interface to do it, it's just going to it's going to blow up because it's going to say, "Oh, you need a key." Um, you know, if I do that, they're like, "Hey, please fill out this field." But no, I don't want that. <laughs> I want you to show me what I get back. Anyway, um, and I don't have a key, so I can't show you how it would even work that way. But the mistake that I made here is the very first query param that you can put in here is your ownership string. And you would find that ownership string, by the way, inside of your wallet. So every wallet owner has an ID and it's this like ridiculously long, uh, I don't know if it's hexadecimal or what, but it's like a really, really long string of characters and you would paste that in here and you'd paste all the other stuff and you'd make it run, right? So that's what I did. I put in my ownership information, I put in my collection name and I returned what was here. So, but let's take a look at something here. The number of owners is two because someone actually purchased one of my NFTs. Um, if you kind of go down here, this one here, Blueberry Pie, was actually sold. You can kind of see the last sale was for 0.075 Ethereum. And if you drill in, you can see it was created by me, but it's owned by B Larval. So if you do a filter by owner and collection, the thing that would come back here would not have included this but the number that's displayed here would have still been seven, but only six would have come by because the collection itself has seven, but the ownership is not the same across all of it. Seems like a really simple and dumb mistake to make, um, but that, that took me a minute. 
<laughs> um, their docs don't necessarily make it clear that the ownership is an absolutely o optional thing, or maybe they do, and I just misread them. Um, in any case, um, so that is pretty much my talk. Um, that's uh, that's that that's all of it. I'm actually going to be taking this code, and it will be going up onto. Doo -doo -doo. Uh, hold on a second. It's going to be going up to my GitHub account, which is github.com slash Mark R. Takata. Apologies for that. A different Mark Takata took the Mark Takata um, uh, GitHub repo name. Um, so Mark R. Takata is the one that you want to go to. Um, and you'll be able to find, I have code from, you know, all of the talks that I've done uh, from Summit, from uh, just a wide variety of, of, of places that I've gone to and, and done talks on um, our collection. So I'm going to go and go through the, the, the questions. If you have questions, please put them into the Q&A pod. Um, I have a question from Paul asking if collection names are unique. Um, and my understanding is that they are actually unique. Um, because if you go into OpenSea.io under collection, the fancy dash Panthers name, that's that's mine, right? Like that's the one that I chose. So yes, um, if you want, if you, whatever, if you've been like a, I don't know, a fancy Panther painter and you wanted fancy Panthers for your NFT, you're out of luck because that is already taken. Um, and I think they do this partially also because it would be very easy for people to uh, to fake a particular one, which I guess they could still do. Um, they could have you know other things. Um, by the way, the names are of course limited by what can be put in the URL, so you couldn't have like like fancy with a at symbol uh, or anything like that. It has to be a valid URL capable thing. Um, dashes are are clearly available. I believe underscores are. Um, but things like slashes, dots, all of that are not available. And, you know, Batman symbol, no, can't do that. Um, so, yeah, let's, um, does anybody have questions? You got to have questions. And if everybody's like wild about NFTs. Let's see. Got a few more coming in. Um, are NFTs all 100% Ethereum? They are not. Uh, they are not. So you can actually mint NFTs on nearly, I don't want to say nearly any blockchain. There are a number of blockchains that support it. Um, the, the, the intersection that you need to hit is a marketplace that supports the blockchain uh, that you want to put your stuff on. So for OpenSea, um, that's Ethereum and that's Polygon right now. Um, other marketplaces may support other blockchains, uh, and you know it's just going to grow. It's going to continue to evolve, and more are probably going to be uh, added. So um, that was Joshua who asked that. So thank you for that question. That was that was a really good one. Um, Sarah, will there be a a replay of this talk available to listen to again? Yes, absolutely. So this is being recorded, and it's going to be put up onto our YouTube channel. Um, if you got here from my LinkedIn or from Twitter. Uh, it I will be posting when that comes on board. Um, if you got here some other way, uh, hopefully we'll be able to message it uh, back to you so you can see it. It will take a little bit of time because it does have to be, you know, uh, put up there and edited probably um, and, and all that. So yes, it will be available. Uh, Terry says, so E20, 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 fancy E20 may, may be available. Yes, please make that. Terry, <laughs> I'll, maybe I'll even buy one of your NFTs. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, and, and something by the way uh, that that I, I guess I, I kind of talked about this before, but um, it, you know this is this is one of the big you know oh NFTs aren't a real thing, and you're right they're digital they're they're kind of they're as real as anything else on online. But if you go in here, I mean, I can take this image and I can open it in a new tab and I can save it. And then, oh, I just stole an NFT from myself, right? But you really didn't. All you stole was the, 
you know, the, the kind of the picture of it. You don't actually have an ownership stake in it, if that makes sense. Now, what you could do, which is hilarious, and people have done this, is they actually will will like um, let's say you wanted a an icon on Twitter that was a fancy panther, but you didn't want to buy my fancy panther. You could you could right click, save it, mint it yourself under your name, and then put it on Twitter. And then you know when people saw it, they'd go, oh, he bought a whatever, an ape or a, a, a panther or whatever. Um, well, yeah, you could, um, but it's kind of like a fake Gucci bag, right? The moment anybody goes in and see, and looks at that particular NFT, they'll see it was minted by you. It wasn't originally minted, minted by the artist. Now, you might not care. Nobody might care. I mean, who cares that it was made by me? Who am I, right? Like, it doesn't really matter. But some people do care. Some people care about who the artist is behind the piece of art. It's just kind of a thing. So, um Let's see. So NFT is sort of a digital sign on blockchain when sold. This is from Rama. Um, yes, it is. It's it's like it's digitally signed using a very complex algorithm in some ways. Um, and it also includes things like who the original ownership was, the history of the item, um, a picture of the thing or the music or whatever the actual item is. It's all kind of cooked into that, that thing. So yes, that's kind of a... Uh, Thing. What kind of server resources are needed to run a basic NFT mint? Um, I don't have a good answer for that because it would depend on the blockchain you were trying to mint onto. Um, but just generally speaking, it takes a lot of horsepower to do this. Um, when people are, for example, uh, minting blockchain, or you know whatever you want to call or minting uh, um, sorry uh, Bitcoin when they're mining Bitcoin right they have warehouses full of rack servers like it's ridiculous it's it's like you could heat a small country with the amount of power I and literally I mean I mean this literally like they're huge warehouses with millions of dollars worth of of equipment in there and and so to actually like run your own mint. I mean, could you do it? I don't know. Like, do you have a, <laughs> have a rich cousin who owes you a favor? I don't know. Um, but uh, it, it would be pretty much out of the range of most normal people. Um, where's the YouTube channel? Um, actually, um, Aishwara, could you put the YouTube channel uh, into the chat? Um, I can actually hold on. Hi everyone. Hey, my my connect just crashed. Apologies for that. Um, let me go back and share again. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so, oh, not cold fusion scraping. Cold fusion YouTube. So there you go. If you just, um, yeah, if you just do Cold Fusion uh, YouTube, um, it's the, oh, okay, here you go. YouTube.com Adobe Cold Fusion. There you go. Perfect. Um, so let's see, Sarah, okay, you, you received it from the Cold Fusion mailing list. Great. Um, hopefully you'll get something there. Um, if the website hosting the image you sold goes away, your purchase is basically nothing now. Um, yeah, I mean, that's actually a really good question. And, um, that's kind of a, a part of the issue here. Um, the other thing, Jeff, also is if you, if the website or the company that's running the blockchain goes away um, and there's no support for it, like if OpenSea implodes for some reason or, or something like that, or gets purchased and killed by a, a, a different thing, 
your thing could go away too. It's it, it's kind of yeah. It's there's some question there about like how long this is going to last or or whatever. It's it's like I don't know t tomagachis or beanie babies, right? Like they had value, um, but then like they didn't have value later. Yeah, it's 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 a little bit weird. So. Um, Steve asks, if you're displaying on your own site and someone sees it there and wants to buy, how far down the purchase path will the link on your site get the user? Um, meaning, can your link add it to the OpenSea cart or equivalent? So um, right now, the link that is being sent uh, to for folks is actually this link here. Um, where, oh, sorry, let me let me do one that's, that's actually for sale. My bad. Uh, here. Um, it's one click and then, oh, thank you, OpenSea for, there you go. Uh, there's a buy now here that, that you can go. So um, there's not, unfortunately, a API-based link that, um, that will go directly to the thing putting it something there. Um, Sarah asks, what's the difference between an ownership stake versus purchasing the NFT? That's a really good question. So um, the ownership stake, the, the proof of work that originally is done to mint this um, takes a significantly higher amount of computational uh, force basically to, to, to do versus just changing it to change the owner, um, I think. I might be wrong on that actually, but um, there is a difference though. Basically the ownership stake is creating it, um, purchasing it just changes who the owner is. And it may actually be that it's a similar amount of computation. Like a lot of this is sort of um, shell gamey, right? Um, and, and hidden behind the scenes, which is why a lot of people are very nervous about NFTs. Um, Sir also asks, are NFTs unique? Only one owner per picture. Um, it, NFTs are unique, only one owner per NFT. Um, so if somebody took that picture and minted it under a different NFT, another position on the blockchain, the pictures would be the same, right? Because you copy and pasted the picture and, and it's the same thing. Um, the idea here is who was the artist? Who was the original person who, who, who did this? Um, and that's really the only difference. Now, does that make a difference in the value? Questionable, right? Um, you know, what's to say that somebody else, like maybe someone famous decides that they like Fancy Panthers and they're going to mint them. And then people will go, oh, I want to buy it from that person because they're listed as the person minting it. And that's more valuable than Mark. Like, who the heck is Mark? So, yeah, there's um, there's issues there. Um, besides pictures, music, what other things might people sell using NFTs? Um, pretty much anything that's digital can be sold. So um, 3D uh, items, uh, animations. Um, some people are are selling NFTs of actual productions of of like movies. Like you can gain an ownership stake in a particular miniseries, for example. Like there's all kinds of things. Um, some of it is just limited by our imagination. Like I said, somebody minted uh, a pretend invisible statue uh, as an NFT, right? And who would buy that? I don't know, but someone did, and they spent like a quarter million on it. Which I'm just like, oh my gosh. And we all work nine to five, and this guy's like making a quarter million off of a pretend statue. Um, yeah, it's 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 a little weird. Um, Joshua Rose, can you address smart contracts in NFTs? Does the API, um, Joshua? I you know I don't know if there's an access to that. Um, you'd have to kind of dig down into the API. I was kind of just kind of surface leveling it. Um, a bit and then Sarah lost video. I don't know when that was, but um, okay. So we're getting pretty close to the end of our time. Did anyone have any other questions? Uh, let's see. Um, hopefully people are still seeing my video feed and hearing me. Maybe. Uh, 
Cool. Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to put back my information. Um, so my email, as I said before, is takata at adobe.com. Feel free to email me um, on Twitter. I'm at Mark Takata. Feel free to follow me there as well. Um, on Twitch, I am uh, streaming every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific. Um, I have a little show called Fool Around and Find Out. Um, it's essentially me just kind of um, poking around in Cold Fusion. Um, oh, okay, I got some more questions coming in. Uh, what are the popular places people advertise NFTs? Um, so the places I've really seen are uh, places like Twitter is very, very popular. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of, I'm like, I am not, a, for all, all intents and purposes here, I am not an NFT bro. I'm not like a crypto guy at all. I own a little bit of it and I've just had a lot of people asking questions about it. So I, I wanted to kind of share uh, how you could go about doing something with Cold Fusion and NFTs. Um, so I don't really know where the popular places are, Sarah. Um, Rama, if I have a digital design that I wanna sell to many, can I use NFTs to sell it? Um, not really. So there, there's really not any way to do that, Rama. Um, you would have to mint individual versions of it. And then it would be like um, if you've ever gotten a print that's like one of a hundred, right? You'd have to print like a hundred of them and they would each have a unique name, you know, 001, 002. And then people could buy that limited set of a hundred, but you couldn't just mint one NFT and sell that to a hundred people. That's not how this really works. Um, oh, I see. Sorry, Sarah. So the vi video feed was when my, <laughs> when my connect bombed. Apologies for that. Sorry about that. Um, so again, my GitHub is up there. GitHub Mark R. Takata. Uh, my LinkedIn is also there. Please feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on the CFML Slack. If you are here because you're a Cold Fusion developer and also interested in NFTs, I am on there as Mark Takata Adobe. Uh, you can get me there, you know, pretty much all day and sometimes even at night. <laughs> I'm there kind of a lot. Um, and I do have daily office hours right here at um, my.adobeconnect slash Mark Takata uh, on Mondays from 10 to 11. It's just an open, my door is open if people want to come in and chat with me uh, about Cold Fusion. Uh, if you want, if you have questions about NFTs, I don't know that I know much more than I've shared here, but um, if you just want to like chat with me and ask me about Adobe, or uh, if you want to talk about VR, I'm also really into VR. Uh, come by, stop by, chat. Uh, my, my door is open for an hour uh, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific time. So, Let's see. Uh, awesome. Uh, you're very welcome, Rama. You're very welcome. Um, what is the YouTube channel where this, this will be reposted? It is YouTube slash Adobe Cold Fusion, all one word, Sarah. Um, and it will, and I'm not sure when it will be posted. It's going to take a little bit because we need to take this video and, and maybe edit out <laughs> where my connect blew up. Again, sorry about that. Um, and and kind of get that down to uh, a manageable thing. Uh, maybe put an intro on it or that. So it, it's going to take a minute, um, but that's where it will be. By the way, you can also find previous webinars that I've done there, previous webinars by uh, other folks. Um, and there's also, um, oh, put YouTube link in chat. Sure. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Aishwarya. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so yeah, and in fact, I think um, I'll add in future webinars the link up here in my questions uh, and informational slide as well. Sweet. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I appreciate you coming by and listening to me chat about NFTs and Cold Fusion. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, it's been wonderful seeing you all here and chatting about NFTs. Um, thanks again. And by the way, I will be having a webinar per month, um, usually around this time and date in the same place. So keep an eye out for that. I'll always be posting it onto LinkedIn. You'll probably also be getting it in your email if you got uh, an invite to this in your email. So I look forward to seeing all of you there next time. And thanks again for coming.